Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Eric Miskell Show. I am Eric Miskell with EMS Now. Uh, joining me as always is my colleague Phil Stoughton from Australia as co-host. Um, today we're here to talk about the EMS industry in Southeast Asia. We've done this, I think, annually. Uh, we do we get an update. And today we're glad to have two executives from two different uh, EMS companies um, joining us. So let me start by introducing them, and then I'll allow them to each say a little bit more about their operations. But we have Mr. Arthur Tan. He is the CEO of IMI, uh, EMS company based out of the Philippines. And we have Dung Tran, Vice President, Managing Director of Spartronics Far East Operations. Uh, Spartronics is a uh, US-based EMS company, and Dung oversees the, their facility in Vietnam. So welcome all. Look forward to this conversation because Southeast Asia is an exciting um, region, uh, both globally for and also for the industry. Um, Arthur, why don't I begin with you and allow you just to introduce yourself and say a little bit more about IMI and what you also have in Southeast Asia there. Uh, thank you, Eric. And hi, Philip. Don. Uh, yes, so I, I'm, I'm Art Tan. I, I represent IMI. We're headquartered here in the Philippines, but we actually have a global footprint. So the, the Asian side of us is we have a China plus one strategy where we have five facilities in China and then plus a couple of facilities in the Philippines. Uh, and then on top of that, we do have the other mar regional markets on a global basis that we cover. So there's, uh, there's the European side, Bulgaria, Serbia, Czech Republic, and then there's the North American side, which is in California and in Mexico. So yes, uh, as far as footprint grows, our, our largest footprint still dominates here in Asia and, uh, and with, the, with the most number of headcounts. Uh, however, as you know, the world has transitioned that uh, no, um, a lot of the products that's actually being built is, is now have to be consumed in the area where it's actually built. And we're catering to that multi-regional and uh, multi-site uh, perspective for, for our customers. So that's, that's a short interview. So uh, a short introduction on, on IMI. Good, thank you, sir. Dunn, tell us about you and Spartronics, please. Eric, thank you. Yeah, Eric and, and Phil, it's always uh, nice to uh, join your uh, you know, yearly show here. It's, uh, it's an honor. Thank you very much you know, for uh, inviting me to the show. Uh, again, my name is Young Chen. I am the uh, VP Managing Directors of Spartronics Far East Region. And Spartronics is a global company. Uh, we are focusing on the tier three, tier two complex, uh, you know, low to uh, mid volumes uh, electronics manufacturing and services. We are focusing on three segments, uh, you know, in the US, we're focusing on uh, defense and aerospace uh, segments, medical segments, and industrial segments. For far east uh, regions, uh, we do all of that. Uh, that you know uh, has nothing to do with ITAR. Uh, for uh, Vietnam, for example, uh, we've been growing pretty nicely, uh, capturing you know the uh, catching the, the the wave of, of the growth in Southeast Asia, like Art mentioned. Uh, so we've been going to uh, a new facilities. Uh, almost uh, 200,000 square foot uh, facilities here uh, in, in Vietnam. And, and it is our uh, offshore solutions for, uh, you know, global uh, services. And in Vietnam, we are uh, focusing on uh, commercial aerospace, uh, medical products, and industrial uh, commercial products. So uh, very looking forward to uh, answer any questions that you might have uh, about the region here. Excellent, excellent. Well, before we jump into the industry, I thought it'd be be worthwhile to, to discuss the region too, because I think Southeast Asia is an exciting uh, uh, region of the world for a lot of reasons. And you know, I was, I was looking. You know, you think of everything; it's kind of east of India, south of China, right? And it's got about what eleven countries made up in there. But you know, over six hundred and eighty million people live there, right? So there, it's a very rich 
And, and I was looking at the demography. I've been doing a lot of studies on demography lately. And, and it's fascinating because you have a very, a lot, it's, a lot of older ones have the upside down pyramid, right? More older people than younger. But that's not the case when we get into most of Southeast Asia. It's very, very strong in those 20 to 40, 45 to 65 range, right? And that gives it a real strength, both from a workforce and a consumption perspective, uh, but also a strong worker base and a lot of young people um, within that. So, you know, maybe Art, I'll start with you. You know, the region itself is is vital uh, and I think has a very exciting, you know, decade ahead of it here. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, a, a, in the past and then and, and uh, it was always uh, the focus there for Asia has been China and Japan because they were the ones that were actually driving the economy and the largest GDP for the area. But as you said, the, the demographic dividend of the age, uh, the young age, and now, you know, about 600 million strong, ex-China, ex-Japan, right. uh, we're, we're destined to be, I think, the third or, or the fourth largest economy moving forward, becoming even bigger than Europe mm -hmm. uh, because of its wow. aging and uh, its situation as well as, as mm -hmm. ours. Like in the Philippines, our, our average age out of 108 million people, our average age is 24. So that's that's wow. the size. And it, we're a consumption economy. Yeah. So, so given that perspective and the direction that now Asia is no longer just a, a, a uh, place where you would then uh, use, but actually becoming a, a consumption base as well. Yeah. And so it becomes much more important uh, from a strategic basis as to how you're going to be able to not only use the demographic dividend that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. but as well as, as actually take part of this uh, growing uh, economy. No, absolutely. Yeah, so you've got... You've got that wonderful combination of talent and consumers there that you can you can really leverage. And is having established the age of that talent, is that talent also coming out of um, coming out of school or college with with graduate level education? And are you able to recruit lots of engineers? Does it mean there's a lot of talent for for the for the manufacturing sector? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the unique thing about Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, or Asia, Asia culture in general, we put a significant amount of, of value to education. Mm. So even in the Philippines, for example, we're not a first world country, we're definitely a developing economy and a country, but 98% of our, of, our, of our population are, are literate, uh, mm. written and spoken. So that's, that, that, that puts, a lot of, uh, puts a lot of effort into education or getting educated, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then this is not just the Philippines, because I travel. I travel in Vietnam. I mean, even in Vietnam, as Don would, would attest to this, because I was actually impressed that, you know, uh, they, they even speak multiple languages. <laughs> and, yeah. and to that level, you know, so, so yeah. yes. Uh, I think workforce, and, and right now, if you ask all the CEOs globally, including myself, one of the challenges is finding finding it's resources and talent. Mm. So, yeah. so this is the place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's the place that you have the least problem. What about you, Dung? How do you, how do you see Vietnam specifically? Right. I, I, you know, to, to uh, Eric's point, I, I think Southeast Asia is really an attractive, you know, region due to its, you know, geographics, you know, regulatory, economics, and demographic advantages, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to our, you know, points about the skill set, it's not only the pool of resource, you know, uh, out of college, but the unique things, right? The uniqueness thing about Southeast Asia, in my opinion, is different skills set across, you know, the Southeast Asia region, right? You got, you know, Singapore focusing on the high end, the R&D, Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know Vietnam and, and you know Philippines focusing on the assembly work, uh, and and with you know the, the population that you know uh, reaching seven hundred millions, two thirds of that it's in the workforce, really young workforce. You know to uh, to our point, mm -hmm. uh, so I I would say you know the the momentum and the golden opportunity for Southeast Asia is here. We, we have very good you know tailwind. Right, uh, right now, still Southeast Asia 
is considered to be uh, low cost assembly work. Yeah. So the opportunity to you know move up the manufacturing value chain is tremendous. So imagine mm -hmm. if you move up the value chain, the how much revenue that you can add right to the region in the next five years. Yeah, uh, so that's already it's, happening, isn't it? That's already it happening. Happens. You're already seeing exactly. more and more R and D. You know, you look at your footprint in particular. Uh, you've got you've got engineering and you've got R and D in, you know, in in um, in the Philippines and in what we would traditionally consider those low cost regions. So that that's changing, and and you're able to produce quite a lot of additional success and and actually additional revenue with 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 hopefully better margins by by getting involved in more and more of that yeah don let me let me can i if i can just follow up with don something on vietnam mm. that i'm curious about you know vietnamese workers have been prized in the electronics manufacturing industry around the globe for a long time i mean they were being imported into into eastern california. europe right you and yeah. in california i ran a prototype shop here in dallas texas and it was primarily at you know great engineers and i'm curious are with the opening up and more going on in vietnam do we see or do you see more workers coming back from overseas to work in the industry yeah, good question, Eric. It's a combination of that. I, I, you know, I spend most of my time in Silicon Valley, yeah. and I would proudly say that the Vietnamese community is part of Silicon Valley growth, especially yeah. in the EMS segment. Yeah. You go to all of the EMS companies, Silicon Valley, Dallas included, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. Vietnamese, you know, workers in there, yeah. you know, who have, you know, made the difference, you know, for this segment. Uh, and, and and you look at the the, the skill set. Yeah, the, the motor skew, for example, at the assembly work, yes, I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the country's become an, an expert in that area. Uh, to your point, you know, what the country is missing really is it's at the leadership level. So if you repatriate people like me from the U.S. returning back and, and mm -hmm. fill that hole and bridge that gap, we mm -hmm. have a complete solution. And then that's yeah. how, you know, chronic Vietnam is positioning right now. And that's how we excel you know, in the last several years. And you're bringing in some global experience that's really valuable there. Just while we're on the region and the changing in terms of um, the the geography of outsourcing and, and what's been going on recently, geopolitics obviously plays quite a substantial role. And I, I guess over the last two to three years, people have been thinking about de-risking their supply chain with respect to China, shifting stuff from China. Lots of people talk about Vietnam, India, Mexico as being the big three beneficiaries of that, but I would add the Philippines into there. Have you seen customers that have actually said, you know, we need to we need to do some correction in our in our manufacturing footprint, reduce our our dependence on China and 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 hence want to increase their activities in other parts of Southeast Asia? Maybe Dung, you can take that first from a Vietnam point of view. Yeah, Philip, thank you. Yeah, it, it's to, to your question, it's not an option anymore, it's a must, right? You know, clearly there's a trend, you know, to exit China and, and, and you know, diversify for risk mitigation. So all of manufacturers and customers, you know, worldwide, we must think about supply chain with, you know, future resilience in mind that they consider a growth opportunity. And, and, and therefore, Southeast Asia plays a very important role in that, you know, uh, uh, you know diversions, right? So, yeah. however, I, I think, you know, we do have a gap in Southeast Asia that we need to bridge in terms of, you know, supply chain resilience, right? And mm -hmm. I, I would say, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the gap is, is the workforce. We need to retrain the, the workforce to run supply chain more effectively in the region. Uh, so that we can position it globally, number one. And number two is in terms of, you know, digitization uh, capabilities. We, we need to quickly digitize, you know, supply chain in the region so that we can address, you know, real time and accurate data, and then we can scale with the growth. Yeah. And Art, from your point of view, you mentioned um, a more regional approach, perhaps, to manufacturing. Does that yeah. kind of match with the some decoupling from China? Um I, 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 let me give you a different perspective. Okay. <laughs> Clearly, depending on which view you're looking at, if you are a U.S. company 
and you have uh, uh, exposure into China, but your market is definitely the United States, then I share Dong's view. Then definitely a decoupling has to happen because that's now a bad word. So, mm -hmm. so, so clearly, right? But then if you have a worldview and you look at the dynamics of the major market, you're talking about the United States being the largest market by not much with China being the second largest market. Yeah. So from a global perspective, as we have, we have to see where China in itself is actually growing. So, you know, I'm happy to note that, uh, you know, we, we, we have hardly any product that we produce in China that we export. Yeah. Everything is consumed. However, think about it. If you take yourself out from a 12 trillion economy, yeah. it, it where's your sense. growth going to come from, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. clearly it has its own life right now because of this geopolitical issue and the trade issue we're having right now. Mm. Is this going to be happening forever? No, I don't think so. But going into it takes time. Getting out of it will take time. And so we'll mm. now to have to go manage that transition. I think one of the unique things that we offer as a company is that we're able to then handle that transition for most of our customers. Most of my European customers uh, require that they continue to be able to produce in China, but not expand. Yeah. Because that's not looked up very well when you go up to the board and try to explain that you're going to go and expand in China, right? So yeah. they look at us to be able to provide that ability for them. Not necessarily do they get out of China, but definitely yeah. there's curtailment in the expansion in China. Yeah. And, but and that's what about. Yeah. But it's still growing. To, uh, Five, six mm -hmm. percent. To our, yeah, to, to our point, I, I'd like to, to, to add, you know, my, my two cents there. I, I think the concentration has been pretty heavy in the past toward, you know, China regions. What we're seeing today is a transition in the decentralization. And Southeast Asia would be a best solution to decentralize that and diversify in terms of risk mitigation. I think that's what we're seeing today. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. And no, no. I think Art's point is really important in that if you're a global brand and some of your market is in Asia and you're working with a global EMS like IMI, um, it's important that the stuff that's being produced for China is manufactured in China. And if there are more ge geopolitical stresses, that becomes even more important. So there's yeah. the, there's there's just the the subtleties of making everything balanced. That's the that's the challenge at the moment, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and it doesn't it, so so the decoupling part, yes, it happens. And so we get a lot more requirement for our Mexico facility right mm -hmm. now because of products that needs to be centrally supporting the United States. So that's our North American footprint. Uh, but then it at, and and then as as what Dong said, then then the, the 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 remnants of that is then there's also the ability to be able to provide that product out of the out of Asia. And we're using the Philippines as 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 our base for that right now because of mm -hmm. The ability of the Philippines to be in a in a in a in a in a, a, a trade agreement that could actually shift very easily to to Europe as well as the United States. Mm -hmm. So so there's there's that balance that needs to be looked at. Uh, I mean, uh, one example for where that transition as just to go back a little bit on the value proposition of Asia. You know, the, the time where Asia is looked at, uh, Southeast Asia is looked at as a low cost region is actually not a correct way to look at it anymore. Because more and more, if you look at the products and services that the tier ones or the brand owners are looking for, and, and, and of course, that's, that's, been, that's been amplified by this uh, supply chain issue during COVID and is, is that more and more, they're looking for a single source of solution for their product, which means that would entail everything from component all the way to complex assembly, mm -hmm. right? And so the ability to be able to provide complex assembly extends beyond just being able to have a manufacturing workforce that requires both process 
and product design support. And so that's where the, the value proposition, uh, and that's something that even here in, in, in Southeast Asia, we're able to do. I think uh, publicly I can share with you that one of the most recent one is that, uh, and you should, I don't know if you're familiar with zero motorcycles, which mm. is, which is the, the, the electric motorcycle coming out of Santa Cruz, California. That we just signed a manufacturing yeah. agreement that they're going to actually produce or we're going to be producing not just the boards or the electronics that's necessary for the full EV motorcycle, but integrating that and building the engine, the motor and, and, and the battery system mm. in, up to the full product. You know, so that's, that's the level of com- complex assembly that's now being able to be offered beyond just being a, doing a board. Yeah, and that's and where everybody's. That, and and t- uh, you'll do that in in Mexico, in Asia, in all of. We're doing it here. Multiple in Philippines. locations. You're doing it in we're the Philippines, Philippines at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's great. I mean, that's that's the future of EMS, isn't it? That's where that's where value add lies, and that's where you become that that solutions partner rather than just a a stuffer of boards, and yeah. um, and that's where you 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 know you deliver the most value to your customer. You know, the net result of what we're talking about here, though, is that there's it's booming in Southeast Asia for the EMS industry. There's money going in there. There's facilities, mm-hmm. right? There's, you know, Dung, you're sitting in a very nice new facility that Spartronics has, has, you know, built over there. There are other ones we hear the stories. And I'm assuming that along with that comes, you know, the infrastructure is being improved, the supply chain uh, you know, is improving. We've talked about the logistics. So speak a little bit about that and kind of the growth that's occurring as a result of, uh, of the increased attention. Yeah, I, I would say the, the catalyst for growth is, yes, growth is coming. It's a golden opportunity. The question is, are we ready? And, and the answer is, yes, we are ready. We are ready from the different, you know, areas, right? From the the new trade pact, the comprehensive economic partnership trade pact that expected to be significantly, you know, accelerate the flow of, you know, manufacturing investment into the region, in, into Vietnam, for example. Uh, that, that's one catalyst for growth. Another one you mentioned, Eric, about the infrastructures. The government in Vietnam, for example, is very keen to invest in infrastructure. Spectronics, you know, uh, it's very keen to invest in Vietnam, and that's why we're growing to a, a better site. Uh, another thing which I think is really important is we are ready in terms of social responsibility as well. Uh, just like us, as we invest in a new site in Vietnam, this new site has the lead goal uh, certifications, right? You know, besides all of the, you know, ISO certifications uh, that, that we need to have to serve, you know, different environments. So, uh, Art talked about, you know, doing the uh, electric uh, motorbike, right? So the facility is your facility demonstrate the social responsibilities in terms of supporting the environment. Uh, so we, we, you know, we go all in and then we put all the investment in in the right way, uh, you know, to build on the, the strong EMS foundation that we already established, right? So we talked about, you know, up the value chain, we talk about vertical integration. That would be, you know, tremendous opportunities, but we need to be ready in terms of infrastructures, in terms of social responsibilities, and in terms of set in order to support the growth. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting what you say about that ESG development. I think that's, um, you know, that's becoming increasingly important to the consumer and that those consumers will push that through to the brands and the brands will want, want to make sure that's in the supply chain. When you look at that art from your point of view, are you seeing that as something that you've got to do globally in, in, in every single region? Well, yeah, as you know, um, you know, IMI is part of the Ayala group. And mm-hmm. I think Ayala is one of the, the first ones in the country to pronounce that we will be, uh, uh, we will achieve net carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, across the entire conglomerate. And so part of that is that we're actually, that's why about, I would say, uh, you know, over 50% of our total revenue comes from, uh, from mobility segment Mm. and of that mobility segment, I would say that we have remnants of less than 5% left that is still just ICE specific and Mm -hmm. everything else has transitioned over to EV or or EV 
uh, hybrid uh, uh, vehicles. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. that's the direction we're taking. And then as a group, uh, we're also the only um, energy supplier for the country uh, at about, uh, I think, five gigawatts of uh, renewable, pure renewable energy, solar and wind only. Yeah. So that so it's a unique thing because we're also signed up to make sure that our scope one, scope two, and scope three uh, matches uh, the, the total requirement to be able to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's super impressive. And I think what's fascinating when you look at the role within ESG of a, of a EMS company, of an outsourced manufacturer, there are so many different different um, faces that you, that you have. You've got to think about the products that you're manufacturing and by making um, EVs or electric motorcycles, there's a contribution there. You've got to think about how you do that in terms of the manufacturing process and the energy you use. And then you've just got to think of the, you know, the entire infrastructure of the business because you're a, you know, you're a, you're a, a big business that's um, that's running multiple facilities. So there are lots of opportunities to improve ESG, and there there are lots of lots of different areas to think about. It's it's very much a holistic approach. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Dung, and I know that with the, you mentioned the ESG, but I've also seen pictures of you your new facility there, and I think the whole. The whole rooftop is covered in solar panels up there. Am, am I mistaken? Wasn't that right? <laughs> and that, that is correct. We we leverage, you know, throughout the day, you know, given the tropical areas that, that we're in, I have, you know, uh, three to four make up, you know, solar power that taking care of the whole facilities, you know, during, you know, the, the, the sunny day here. So, yeah. yeah. Well, lots of sunshine in Southeast Asia. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is so you know you you both have mentioned already i wanted to talk about maybe some of the challenges you know with growth there's always challenges right and we've talked about the one with being the the workforce and you know and then you know arthur i'm hearing you talk too about that transition to the to the ev right away from the ice and is is finding talent uh and the engineering talent for that uh easier more challenging than it was before how how is that uh it's it's harder uh you know it, the, it's harder from the standpoint that more and more it's it, the, the ability to be able to source the talent at the site where the need is mm-hmm. because as you know uh, we've we've been able to get over the barrier uh, for the financial barrier, we can actually trade in any currency we want. We've already gotten through the intellectual barrier because we have access to resources and, 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 and knowledge anywhere we are. The last bastion of barrier that we have still have to come over is human capital barrier because nobody mm-hmm. can freely move where we need them to be. And mm-hmm. so that creates a problem like, uh, like uh, you know, my site in Bulgaria, and then when they leave, they go to Czech and from Czech, they go to Germany. And so then I have to go find another set of, of individuals coming out of either, either Serbia or, or Macedonia in order to backfill that requirement. Mm-hmm. And it would have been great and easy for me if I could just, you know, if, if there was a, a need that I would just move somebody from, from the Philippines and fly them over and have them work somewhere mm-hmm. else and, or, or vice versa. But that's not the case. And so as long as we have that human capital barrier, I think it's, it's incumbent to any industry that we will always have this talent and human capital problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess you've got to train locally, but it would be nice to be able to, um, to have more of a transfer of talent. And because, you know, with that, you get a transfer of ideas. You can send people from the Philippines and they can train people in, in, you know, in Mexico, in um, Eastern Europe, yeah. where, where, wherever those skills are needed and you end up with a better workforce globally as a result. I think it, no. it's, for, for us, it, it's a good challenge to have while you have, you know, demand. And, and you do have demand fluctuate throughout, you know, the globe pretty much, right? So I, I think the key thing is anything that you have to, you know, closely involved, like the assembly levels for us in Vietnam, we do have a, a big pool of resource out there that we can go and recruit the top talent. The way that we dif- differentiate it, it's really, it's our facilities, it's our environment, it's our culture. 
It's, you know, how to take care of people. And that's how, you know, the company become a magnet to attract, you know, those assembly workers. Another thing is to address, you know, the, the well-rounded, you know, workforce, uh, engineering and all of that supply chain. I mean, for Spectronics, we, we truly operate as a global company where we leverage, you know, the technology, for example, right? We, we share the same supply chain database throughout and, and I got support remotely from, you know, my peers uh, in the U.S. And, and it's, it works out beautifully nicely because why we're sleeping our you know brother in the us doing the work and we wake up we got the work we pick it up and we do it again so if you do it in the right way leveraging the technology local pool resource for you know low touch you know assembly work uh, for us it, it's you know the, the global uh, positioning of, of the company you know with us uh local uh mexico we do have a, a you know a facility in mexico for near shoring solution and vietnam has offshoring global solution and it's been working out very nicely for us. Yeah. So how have the uh, the challenges of the last few years with material supply chain? Are those, how persistent are they? Are they just becoming part of the of the scenery now? It's just another element that has to be continually monitored. You're both smiling, so. It's, <laughs> it's that wry smile that I see every time I ask this question, Eric. It's yeah. like, it's, it's better, but it's still not better. Exactly. Yeah. Better, I, but it's still broken. I, I think a shot of this, I, I call the last couple of years, and all right, you should agree with me, it's like a hundred years flat, right? It's a global material crisis, right? It's a hundred mm -hmm. years flat. You know, counting on top of the pandemic, it's bad, but it, it's also good. First to, you know, we're here today, reflect back and learn a lot of lessons. That's why we, you know, all, all of us talking about resilience, we're talking about, you know, supply continuity, and, and, and we, we are more serious in not only planning, but, you know, how do we execute that and how do we put that in, into the practice in the right way. So we, you know, one of the, the, the you know, the, the, the track that we monitor very closely is, you know, the, the electronics materials, right? And, and, you know, how does it go? And then it, it did go up, you know, with, you know, uh, office of supply demand, and now, you know, swing back down, right? So I, I, clearly electronics trend, you know, especially the chipset and such, you, you see a reduction in the demand. The, the price is not tracking very closely. We, we all wish right, our, the price is tracking that, you know, lower demand, but it's not, it's lower. But we do, we start to see some stabilities, um, the lead time for some of the, you know, uh, unique, uh, you know, chipset, it's still very long, but we, we do, I, I do see improvement. I, you know, if, if you look at the industry, uh, you know, overall, that's for the electronics part, but for the electromechanical, like the plastic, the sheet metals and, and it, it, the materials, I think it's much more stabilized. And, and, and for me uh, in, in the region, especially in Vietnam, I see much more growth in the localizations of those commodities, of plastic, of, you know, everybody is building, you know, the satellite and the EMS so that, you know, we can support each other uh, in a much more productive way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Building ecosystems, yeah. that's... Um, yeah, yeah. That's just imagine. to add to that one, I, I guess, you know, I, I see it that because we've been in this industry long enough, we've seen this ebb and flow, you know, mm -hmm. we build capacity, too much capacity, then they cut off the capacity and therefore prices starts going up and supply chain starts getting tighter. And we, we've seen this cycle several mm -hmm. times already in my career. What has kind of made it unique over the last couple of years was we did, I'd never seen this cycle compound itself with logistics. Right. So we had we've had supply chain issue, but we never had it concurrently with logistics issues. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now we had a double whammy. We had a perfect storm. Not only were the materials not available, but you can't even get it where your supply, your, your logistics cost was more expensive than the product cost. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, yeah. that happened. That happened. Right. So then, so that's a unique thing that we ate. So one of the, and then as what Don was saying, always a blessing when there's a crisis, that's when innovation comes in. That's when yeah. you start rethinking all of these given mantras on lean, on, on just-in-time manufacturing, on all of these things that makes you want to be one of the best manufacturing sites that all then goes 
to pot, right? Yeah. <laughs> you now had to go relook at what is the most efficient way that you're going to be able to supply and support your customers and still be financially viable. Mm. And yeah. that crisis generates a lot of innovation. And so we've learned how to then start, you know, planning and, and, and scheduling to, to what you can build and what, not what you may need. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so on and so forth. So, Again, like I said, I don't think we're going to see that cycle again relatively soon where we're going to have a, 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 a component supply issue together with a logistics issue. Yeah. We will have that component because we're going to go through this process. We're gonna, how many fabs are we going to put online yeah. in the next, what, five years, right? So mm-hmm. I'm anticipating that in the next five years, there's the cost of the components will drop down. Because yeah. they're going to be so much capacity for sub nano fabs, and and so we'll have enough chips to run it. But in the meantime, we're going to have to go live through this cycle. It's already getting better, as what yeah. Dong said. So I, I anticipate that the next five years is just going to get easier and easier. It's a it's a question of what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Exactly. And, um, and I think what's really also interesting uh, is the. You know, the the issue with logistics, that kind of plays even more into the in region for region. You know, if we can right. avoid shipping stuff in um, in containers all around the world, then, uh, you know, there, there's a benefit there as well. Yeah, yeah I have to, if there's another thing I'd like to add that, you know, we, we experience ourselves really, and, and to me, it's, it's really valuable that throughout, you know, the perfect storm, or call it, I call it the 100 years flood, throughout this crisis, <laughs> Never than ever before, we truly, you know, have the best relationship, partnership, very comprehensive, above, you know, strategic with our person. Because we have no choice. We have to really work together as a partner, understand, you know, the forecast and all of that in order to plan, right, to, and to, to navigate, you know, the, uh, the, the storm. So I, I, I would say... Throughout, you know, the the, the challenges, uh, you know, we get closer together, we partner better so that together we can, you know, provide the best solutions. Yeah, and that has to happen in both directions on the supply chain, doesn't it? I think during the crisis, you forged much closer relationships with customers because you've been giving them so much bad news. Um, and, you know, you, you've, you've got to learn to communicate in that environment. You've got to learn to work together. I hope what that produces is a little bit more stickiness with the customer where they're able to have perhaps give you a longer forecast and actually be better partners on their side as well. Um, there are obviously challenges with the component distribution industry and how they partner, but what we should come out of this with is a is a better ecosystem that you know that, that works better on both sides. Eric, you left us for a short while. Nice to have you. I know. Back. This is, you know, You're the, now in the bottom corner rather than the technology top here in Texas can be challenging, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but listen, you know, with that, though, as you're talking about that and the changes, and it, what do you what do you think is still needed then, you know, relative to, to the tools and, and the the within the industry, not the, the the machinery type things, but it's really the 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 digitalization, the connectivity, the, the announce all of that. You know, there's a lot that's being made out of AI these days as well, right? And how that that can really help improve. You know, in your opinion, you know, where would you like to see continued growth and improvement? Uh, if, yeah, if, if, I'll, I'll let Dan start. Go ahead. I, I think we, we we are in the middle of the transitions from heavy concentration in China. Now it's you know across Asia. So the decentralization is there. Uh, very golden opportunities for uh, you know Southeast Asia to go up manufacturing value chain. I think that's what it's happening, and that's what we need to do more. And and you know we need to understand in order to go vertical integration, go up the value chain. What are the gaps, and what do and, and we need to fill that gaps. And there's you know a number of gaps there. So we need to focus on that uh, to be uh, successful. Uh, we look at the next generation industry for that old technology and the amount of pressure of companies, right, to not only deliver the products, to not only, you know, ensure resilience and supply continuity, 
But I mentioned earlier, it's also to lower the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not only what you do, but how you do it, right? And the whole ecosystem. So I think that's what we need to focus on in order to, you know, scale this growth in, in the right manner. Very good. Yeah. No, I, I think I, you know, I agree. You know, the industry 4.0 in itself is is has merit I'm, I'm a i'm a i'm a supporter but i also believe in what i've seen is that as the product become more complex it's really a hybrid manufacturing environment that i see more and more rather than either you go full automation and 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 versus full manual so there's there's going to be uh, what I would consider the, the instead of robots will be cobots, which would then alleviate a lot of the, the, the mundane decision making process out of the operator. But then the skilled part of it mm -hmm. will still be necessary to be done by hand. Right. And so so that's that's going to be where we're going to have to go optimize. Now, the, the challenge will be how to be able to transport that in multiple sites. Because the, I, my view is that, and if I've always had this view, is that there's never going to be a single, single area for manufacturing for the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always going to be, and then and, and more so now as, as we live through this issue on supply chain, that regionalization is really the answer. Plus, a lot of, P, a lot of governments don't want any of their incentive tax dollars to go outside of their region anyway. So if they're going to go ahead and incentivize you, they want to make sure that it benefits the country and not be benefit mm -hmm. somebody else. So we given all of those variables and factors, I see that more and more that, 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 that digitization will be required in order to manage that more efficiently. And at the same time, use, like you said, the, the, the augmented artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or, or just data analysis to be able to make the right decision at the right time much more efficiently. Um, mm. There's still that overhang here that, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure Dong understands as well, is that, you know, the world does not does not live in a single language at all. And so being able to manage the data and being able to control system, to put control systems and governance systems in multicultural, multilingual, you know, a, a multi geography environment is not a cakewalk mm -hmm. either. Because yeah. each, each workforce that I have culturally looks at the world differently. And so we'll have to adjust to that and make sure yeah, to some level there is standardization, but at another level, the, the ability to have that unique uniqueness within that one site gives you that additional advantage, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, diversity is diversity is hugely valuable, isn't it? And yeah. I really, I really thought it was interesting the point you made about the uh the investment dollars that come from various different governments things like the chips act but the the you know the the likelihood of uh, a very similar um thing in europe different investments yep. in different parts of asia oh. all around the world you've really got to put a multinational multicultural hat on and you've got to leverage those in the regions that they're relevant and make sure you're uh you're you're operating within those frameworks. So yeah, being a uh, being a global EMS at the moment requires a lot of uh, a lot of Jug concentration and a lot of a yeah. lot of juggling, spinning yeah. plates. Hey, so I mean, we're going to need to wrap this. So let me just kind of ask you both to kind of look forward for the region, right? And we've been talking about the differences, and it's the culture, it's the business practices, it's the infrastructure is different, and probably even the ease of doing business is, is going to be different in different areas, right? So as you look forward for, for, for the rest of, say, this decade, um, for, for Southeast Asia, uh, how do you see it developing? Are there particular areas that may not be very well developed right now that you see as up and comers? Dung, well, what do you think? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I think for me to conclude this call, really, I mean, you, you look at the confluence of major trends, it's really prompting toward you know companies across you know the globe on where and how they make and source you know their the product, right? So the, the trend is there. And, and uh, Southeast Asia, you know, 
if we catch up on, on this trend, tremendous growth in the next decade. Right now, you look at the last several years, 5% you know, average growth. I would say that we're going to increase this much more if we catch up on this trend. This is our overall and opportunity. Okay. That's uh... Yeah. Art, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I would say, I, I, yeah, I share the same sentiment. Uh, I, I think uh, Southeast Asia is well poised uh, for the next decade, predominantly because, like I said, I don't think this this shift between our between China and the U.S. is going to go away as quickly as it started. So there's going to be that that potential opportunity for Southeast Asia to take on that role. Uh, mm -hmm. that China had for the world. And, and, and so given that, that perspective, then we're going to see uh, a, a, an upsurge. Um, now, one other thing is beyond that, uh, Southeast Asia in itself, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is also growing as a consumption economy. So we are going to be naturally the place to have it built anyway, because it's not going to be exported. It's mm. going to be consumed here in, in, in Asia. Like, like right now, you know, we get products from Thailand, we get products from Vietnam and vice versa. I, I, do, uh, I do some motorcycle manufacturing for KTM and, and we export that out to Thailand, Vietnam, China and everybody in Asia. So, yeah. so in itself, I think the next decade it will be a good time for Southeast Asia on both counts that there is business to be had aside from being able to use it as springboard for being able to produce manuf uh, complex manufacturing for the rest of the world. Yeah. yeah, I think you're in a great spot. You've got you've got a a wealth of talent, you've got a wealth of experience in the um in the region and as you say you've got an up and coming um group of consumers, nearly 700 million, um, that's really going to have a positive impact. And uh, I think uh, the future looks bright. So lots of opportunity. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Art, Dung, you both are always great gentlemen to interview. You, uh, you gave great insights, and I know our audience appreciates it. And hopefully we can do this again in the future.